two Aussies sitting on the Gold Coast, Australia said, hey, let's go and ride the Alps. Could be a lot of fun. Yeah, people talk about research, which means Google search. But in fact, we decided to make more of a sort of a fundamental plan of let's try and rehearse it, get together the, the luggage, the bike, figure out what we're going to bolt onto the bike and get a bike from the dealer. Went down to the dealer and got a KTM 1290. Um, took a whole bunch of measurements, made some parts, um, got some baggage liners, even uh, helmets on board. We had to figure out how we wouldn't scratch the visors. So we took them on as hand luggage and put glad wrap, cling wrap. The best flight we could get was uh, over Japan. So we went Tokyo Frankfurt, which sort of flew over the Arctic Circle. <laughs> so it was quite a weird way to get to Europe. Japan was such a culture shock for me. I just couldn't believe it. We Not just went to a small little 7-Eleven style stall and they just spent ages in there looking at every item. Pilot strike in Japan. No worries. We'll figure something out. Except we had two hotels booked. The first two days were pre-booked. The rest was not. And the bike, it didn't matter so much about the bike. The guys at Admo in Europe were pretty good about not charging us for the day we weren't there. The toilets were great. I absolutely loved the toilets in Japan and I can't recommend them enough. Yeah, but the hotels weren't going to move and it was going to be an insurance job, so we didn't really want to deal with that. Um, so as soon as we got to Frankfurt, we scurried around like rats. Rushed over to the dealer, the bike hire shop, I should say, and um, took the bike back to the hotel and prepped it up, put a whole bunch of safety gear on it. Stickers, lights. We pre-measured phone bracket and GPS bracket. They all went on. Boom. We left. I mean, there was so much uncertainty, but somehow I, I knew I wanted to go there. I was curious and I, I just wanted to go there. And then it was down the autobahn. First time for both of us. Well, on a motorbike. I think we were on the autobahn and you said, how do I record with this GoPro on my head? I said, I'll show you tonight. So your first day we only shot video from the front camera. It's weird riding on the autobahns. I mean, fast traffic goes on the left side, which is weird for us in Oz, we drive on the left side. And slow traffic on the right. And by fast, I mean 300 kilometers an hour. So we would do 200 to overtake some cars, kilometers an hour, but you had to quickly scurry out of the left lane because a couple of ninjas would go past doing 300, making you look slow. I really noticed the difference when you pop your head out to the side, the wind would catch it and just about rip your head off. Wow, quite a difference. It never got old. I just loved overtaking trucks. I thought it was fabulous. Well, you know, your life's in the balance, so you sort of tunnel vision concentrate on everything that's coming. For me, it was my one chance to get on the European roads and give it a bit of a fang because uh, for Australians, we run around at a nanny state here, constantly being told to go 60 when we shouldn't be. And I mean, the reason we were two up, although I had a motorbike license already, I'd only had it a few months. So I was a bit nervous to ride there, so we went put in initially. We're very lucky though, we had great weather that first day. Made really good time down to Memmingen. We actually arrived there in the daylight, which was fantastic. Oh, Memmingen is a great spot. The brewery there with a hotel in it. <laughs> uh, we, we, we and went a restaurant, back. yeah. It was we just, went back, it was yeah. great. Nice, noisy German pub atmosphere yeah. as well. The food was great, uh, you know. So the, after looking at the weather, we decided to go to Annemann. You wanted to go and the book said it was the hub of Switzerland. So we set sail for uh, Annemann in Switzerland. Yeah, the attraction of Annemann was that there were so many passes 
within a very close proximity and you could actually go through several passes in one day. I really like the idea. Got to the southern side of Germany, we couldn't see the Alps. We were still in flatland as far as we knew. Just trees and roads. The villages are fascinating, but these strange uh, buildings, you know, city walls, you ride through these thick city walls from the old days. And the farm fields have these really nice bitumen roads, a few tractors here and there to avoid, but the fields come right up to these narrow bitumen roads. They're quite well maintained. There's no it problem. Would. Good traction. The bike didn't slip at any point. So we had the nav and we had the luggage worked out. The boxes were full. Yes, they were. Um, we found that the liners worked really well because you could just pop them in and then uh, they had made them a little bit smaller than the... Yeah, and the shoes so could, would go down the edge. The shoes and drink bottles would go down the side. Yeah, because you're always doing this swap between boots and shoes, boots and shoes. So uh, I just had one pair of sneakers and my big riding boots. I had sneakers and thongs with me. Uh, snuck in a, a third pair of footwear. For the showers. <laughs> mm, yeah, there was no fixed plan. We had a book. You had a book, I should say. You'd bought a book. I bought a book from a, a chap who had travelled through Europe and Britain about the best places to go. It wasn't um, Google technology. We didn't use Google for the trip. We used no. a book and then we used Garmin. We just got this new super adventure. It was way more powerful. In those days, the BMWs were 100 horses, and this thing was 160, but still an adventure bike. And it was similar to what I was riding. I was riding an only 1190. It was the bike I wanted and had. We had to go to Frankfurt to get it. Well, it was Frankfurt or Berlin were the two options we had, so we decided on Frankfurt. I mean, most people um, go to Milan and get all their bikes there, but we didn't want a Ducati. We didn't want a BMW. We'd ridden those before, and we wanted the KTMs. This is 2015 and GoPro 3 was the, the thing. We had the 3 Plus. The dash cam, I wanted a camera to um, film my reflective visor. So I bought a Xiaomi Chinese sort of GoPro and put it on the front to film the pilot's view reflected in, in the visor, the oncoming view. So it's like a 360 view in a way. Phone, what do we use our phones for? Uh, basically to find accommodation, that was really all. Yeah, mainly bookings.com. Mm. Every day at lunchtime we'd uh, decide what direction we were going, pick out a town and then start <laughs> looking for somewhere to stay. I mean, I found it very comfortable. Uh, it had the heated seats, which um, on the, the quite cold days we were there, they were sort of yeah, the passenger can yeah. has a button for the back yeah. seat, and the pilot has a button in his console. So I generally left mine off. Yeah, but well, the temperatures were five to ten degrees uh, during the day when we were riding, and I would turn it on. But um, I find even on the lowest setting, after about twenty minutes, you had to turn it off again. It was a bit hot. The rocker suits are just perfect. Yeah, they were. Can't faultless. Best ever, and we're not sponsored by Rucker. We no. just love them. Four visors. How did we take four visors? Well, we both each had our tinted ones for good weather, and uh, then we had the clear ones for bad weather or night riding. Yeah. yeah. All the visors have their own pin lock for anti fogging, which was essential. essential yeah. <laughs> rain and pin locks. Yeah, if you open your visor in cold weather, you get rain on your face and then close it, you're doomed. Exactly. So there can't be any rain inside the helmet.
hotel wise we probably spent too much in switzerland everything's expensive there yeah everything was but we did find um in our travels around that there were cheaper places to stay so um yeah i mean andermatt is a magnet and our, that's where we stayed but i think if we ever went back which we said we would we would probably stay at smaller hotels what they call pensions on the passes so like on system pass we saw a pension with a sign out the front for half the price of the room we had back in Andermatt. But on the other hand, Andermatt, I mean, for a first time experience, was a really good place to stay. The views are incredible from there. And um, it was in the middle of the loop going around the Susten, Grimsel and Furka passes and right near the St. Goddard. So yeah, it was it, a perfect spot. I would say it's not perfect. I would say the lo the area is perfect, but the town itself is more expensive than the surrounds. True. I loved would be going along some of these curvy roads and then suddenly you'd be next to a river or something like that and you'd hear the water so loud just running over little rocks and stuff. Mm, glacial melt everywhere. So they have unattended fuel stations and what happened is if you when you pull up and give it your credit card to start the fuel transfer into your bike it just blocks out 250 euros off your account. So um, I guess if there's a problem with this card being stolen or something, I've no idea why they do it, but it sort of shocked us because we looked at our statements and went, hey, we didn't spend 250 bucks filling up a bike. But a few days later, it was, uh, it was off the account. Yeah, and in. just the proper amount of fuel was taken off. Yeah. I guess the twisty roads is why we go. I mean, there's a certain risk on a twisty road that you could come unstuck, but at the same time, there's a lot of excitement. And wow, this trip really pushed out the adrenaline for me as a rider at Twist of the Roof type California Superbike School stuff um, was what it was all about. Throttle control and cornering, just enjoying the pleasure of cornering. of the shoulder season, probably said this before, but just no caravans at this time, very few at all. Very off. few, yeah. size of the mountains there, I just still cannot believe it. Proper, proper mountains. Huge. And the views were just awesome. Every time you went around a corner, it was just... More. More, yeah. And then more, and then more. Intercom, I mean, Sylvia and I have ridden with Intercom since the first day. Um, we've always had Intercom. Uh, the center worked pretty well. Unfortunately, the center camera system didn't work. It worked in all our tests, but in the cold conditions, it, uh, it didn't record. There was no VU meter. We couldn't tell whether we were recording or not. So you'd, 
clip it on, press record, and just potluck that you, you could see the LED was on, but you couldn't tell if it was recording. And it turned out that most of our videos had no audio of our intercom, which we had hoped to get, but didn't. The bike was uh, pretty much faultless. That amount of power and uh, all that weight from the luggage, it felt nothing. It cared nothing about the altitude. It cared nothing about the incline and just pulled like a beast. Fabulous touring bike, 1290 KTM. Riding gear? Uh, we had the rucker, which was waterproof. Well, Quentin had his rucker gear, and um, I ordered mine. And basically, my suit arrived about two days before we left. <laughs> it was pretty close, and thank goodness it fitted. Yeah, we ended up ordering Sylvia's suit from Germany, and then put it on the plane. We flew back to Germany. That's it. They wouldn't let me pick it up there. <laughs> Bike, everything was rehearsed because we had the, bike, the liner, the three liners, which are like a padded KTM liner system that goes in the panniers. We knew it would fit. You had the big pannier, I had the small right side pannier. Of course. And then the center pannier was like a computer, the laptop power, chargers, camera gear, sort of shared items. And then on top of that, we had a little bag where we would keep our wet weather gear, as in boot liners and stuff like that. Yeah, the yellow bag you'll see from time to time sitting on the box is like a changeover, so if you get rain, you can stop them without having to open the boxes. We do uh, wet weather gear on or off. Uh, anyway, we came to this incredibly long queue and just decided to jump the whole queue and go to the front and see what the cows are doing. Um, and that really paid off. We got to see what they were doing, basically strolling down the road. <laughs> A couple of farmers taking their time, cows strolling down the road. No problem, mate. And this happens all the way across the Alps. We saw evidence that, you know, in Austria and everything, that's had happened as well. On this day. On this day. Boom. And of course, every pass has a gate in front, so you've got to be prepared to get there and find the boom down the pass. We've got a good hydro system in Switzerland and we enjoyed 
all the little lakes and dams that generate the hydroelectricity there. Good places to stop, stretch the legs, and then go again. It's interesting that the lay bars that you could stop in, none of them had little benches or anything like that to sit down and enjoy the view. They, I think they were directing you towards the restaurant. Or maybe it's just generally too cold to do that. We had a little bit of a lunch stop here in the Alpha and Rosalie in the Grimsel Pass. We encountered parking spaces where the bikes got the best parking spaces closest to the facility and the cars were at the back. Something that's great. Never seen <laughs> not. <laughs> yep, you were treated like a human being. Food was pretty good. Yeah, the German style sausage and uh, sauerkraut. I love it. I love eating foreign food. Fabulous. I like the system and the Furka. Sylvia just liked the system. Grimsel. Grimsel. I, Grimsel was my. The Furka was the one you didn't like. Yeah, Furka really didn't like it. The Grimsel for me was my favourite out of those three. Some of the passes are just straight hip and straight hip, and, and they're not quite as good as the ones that are curvy. Uh, I guess that's also why we like the Austrian roads, because the Austrians had set some kind of standard where if there wasn't space to do a tight curve, they were just push the road out and make a bigger curve. When we did stop, we'd try and use our mobile phone. I don't recommend trying to do a pano with a slippery phone case. Drop my phone and crack the screen. <laughs> make sure the phone stays in the phone case. <laughs> mm. You can read about it, you can see pictures, but until you're actually standing there looking at it, you don't realize how big a mountain can actually be. Yeah, well, it's not a racetrack. I mean, I had to be cautious. I never knew what was around the corner, and I certainly didn't want to be injured or injure you. So there was, uh, it was subdued riding. It wasn't like racing, but at the same time, it was a lot of the, uh, adrenaline. I'm just kind of buzzing every time I got off the bike. Wow. So it's repeatedly saying wow. <laughs> Yeah, Roman era cobbled mountain passes um, are great, but don't try them in fully the cloud, rain, mist condition in the cold. Slippery ass. Yeah. So, part of the sort of butt clenching moments in the trip were on this particular pass. In the end, it was all good. One of the very rare pitch checks we saw, and they didn't stop us. Mm. Yeah, not a single check of our documents, apart from the airport, ever. <sighs> had to have a Swiss fondue. We'd had Swiss fondues in Africa, Swiss fondues in Australia, but we'd never had a Swiss fondue in Switzerland. So you ran in, they said, we do them. So in we went. In we went, and it was good. It was real good. Really good. And um, not a blink. No one cared less that we were in full biker gear. Not a glance. Yeah. Nothing. 
started raining extensively in Italy, southern Italy and France. So we decided to go towards Austria. Originally we wanted to go to France and double back to Austria, but with the, with the flexibility and the mission we could just say, no, we're going to Austria now. So we're uh, leaving Andermatt, we've headed east towards uh, Imst, which is near Innsbruck, um, in the thick of the Alps. But its forecast is good. So within a couple of hours we're out the way. Uh, we spoke to an English tour group who was in the hotel with us in Andermatt. And those poor buggers, they were sticking to their schedule, which meant they were going to ride the next four days in heavy rain in France. <laughs> Uh, they'd been to the Stelvio the day before and not seen anything because they'd ridden in cloud and... They'd been looking forward to it for days, got to the top, saw nothing. nothing. Just missed cloud. <laughs> so their tour seemed like a total uh, fail. I guess they didn't have much flexibility. Everything was locked in. Every hotel was booked. Our style of planning was the opposite. Nothing was booked. Biking for us was pretty simple. I mean, the idea was put everything in your bike, ride, book a hotel, go to the next place, take out the bag liners, um, leave the bike outside. A couple of places that do this have inside parking. Uh, maybe half of the hotels, which is a European word for bed and breakfast. But um, that's the the system of traveling. So it's not arduous, it's not hard like camping or difficult or skill required. But uh, for some reason, every day we'd take the stuff out of the same bags, put it back in, it wouldn't fit. Yeah, uh, 2015 GoPro 3 Plus was the latest, greatest action cam, and there was zero stabilization. So, if you see the footage being a bit shaky, apologies for that. Um, now we're using um, GoPro 7s and 8s, which don't have any of these problems. But back then, we had the GoPro 3. <laughs> the tunnels were great. I do love the tunnel systems. Um, I don't know what you do when you get a, uh, a problem in a tunnel, like a crash or a fire, but we never found any of those, so ah. the tunnels were just uh, quiet little places where everyone putted along. No problem, no issue. They all seem to be super polite in the tunnels, there was no like, extra brapping or speeding, anything like that. Mm. Actually, we never got tailgated. I mean, we had the yellow Tour de France bike conversion, which we brought stickers with us and stuck them on ourselves, pre-cut stickers I've measured and so on, but um, just never got tailgated. Oh. There was none of that sort of Australian road rage bike attack going on. So. Well, just generally there just didn't seem to be the road rage thing happening at all. No. Sort of a very pacified community over there.
So to get to the passes, you've got to travel um, through, you know, some flatlands and valleys in the mountains. So most of the roads uh, we travel between passes on these sort of flat car, busier car roads. But as soon as we took uh, one of the passes, it got quiet. It was mm. way, way, way less traffic. The biker's wave is much easier in Europe because you're driving on the right, you can wave with your left hand. Mm. In Australia, we ride, it, <laughs> we ride on the left and our sort of throttle hand is on the right. So over there it was cool, you could take your hand off and wave at bikers in the opposite direction and they could actually see you wave. Yeah, the nod didn't seem to be a thing over there. Not so much, eh? Yeah. Yeah, they use a low hand wave, which they can do. Avalanche tunnels, there's sort of semi open avalanche shields. They're quite intriguing, it's not something I've ever seen before, been in, experienced. I think they're avalanche and rock protection so that when rocks bounce down the mountains, they don't squash your car. Swiss uh, and Austrian ski resorts, eh? Yeah. And we see signs for, you know, ski resorts from the past, like St. Moritz and stuff. People were very sociable. I mean, uh, ordinary car drivers, cage drivers would come over and chat to us and ask us about our trip, where we were from, and they didn't have that sort of, oh my God, a biker, I'm not going to talk to them. Did they? That's true, they were very interested. We struck up a lot of conversations with just rego car people when we stopped. They're fascinated. I think the guys were secretly jealous that they were just handbags. And we were on a bike, or I was on a bike. And they were fascinated that you were on a bike. That's true. The traction control on the KTM was excellent. It always controlled any wheel slip and um, even wheelie control was activated a couple of times when passing. I could feel the system pulling the front wheel back down onto the ground, but it didn't interfere. It, it's a very advanced boss system and it works really well. Uh, the bike was everything it was meant to be. And you said it was pretty stable on the road to the point where if I got um, stiff legs or something like that, there was no problem with me just standing up even when we're going 100. Mm. Yeah, that's right, you would stretch regularly by just standing at the back. And you need a bit of power to overtake cars. You've got to have a bike with enough oomph that when it's fully loaded in a few seconds can get past a couple of cars. Otherwise you're stuck on the run. Oh, oh, at altitude. So. Yeah, yeah. So people might say, why do you need 160 horsepower? Well, I guess you don't, you can go on a bicycle. But having that power just makes overtaking safer because there's less time out in the left-hand lane.
I mean, for us this was a once in a lifetime trip, so we were just going to go to the Alps once and do it. And the decision was, we'd ride some Pillion, and then we'd each have a KDM, and we'd, we'd have our own ride for, for three days as well. Um, I think it was as much fun for me as it was for you. You got to have your own bike and I got to have no Pillion. <laughs> I don't know, better than that, I had my own bike with no luggage. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I didn't even notice the luggage. Just it's weird because just having the pillion off the bike just transformed it from. The... Hey, what are you saying? It's surprising. <laughs> I don't know how many people regularly ride with pillions, but it's a lot of extra work to mo to manage a pillion in in corners. I could tell when you moved your head because it yeah. affected the line of the bike in the corner. Twelve ninety is a talky bike, and it pulls strongly out of corners, regardless of your RPM. Uh, it really was what I wanted, and I loved that bike. There, I, I didn't want to buy it when I came home, of course, because we don't have any Alps in Australia. But for the Alps, it was a the perfect bike. Yeah. bike. Yeah, it was great. So in my early days of riding, um, I collided with a few cars, two cars actually, that just pulled out in front of me, no warning. So I wanted to have a bike fitted with some DRLs. Um, we took our own DRLs, um, checked all the rigging and bolts on the 1290 that we took a test for a test ride, so we measured everything up. We knew everything would fit, so it all plugged into the cigarette light of the GPS and the headlights ran. All the amps were checked, fused, wiring, and that worked out. Not a single car pulled out in front of us on the no. whole trip. And then for the back, we'd watched Tour de France, I don't know how many times, and seen all the bikes, all the police bikes and camera bikes with yellow on the back pannier. Large um, strips of yellow. Yeah. Big pieces of fluoro yellow. So we also wanted that so we didn't get rear-ended in a dark tunnel or something. And yeah, all... you don't know where you're going to end up, what kind of place you're staying in, even what meal you're going to eat that night. It all just depended on where you ended up. 
Yeah, so not having that security of the whole trip planned out may be seen as a negative. I have heard people saying I wouldn't want to go unless I knew I had a room. Uh, it wasn't a problem. It was not a problem. It absolutely wasn't a problem. And, you know, when we felt that, you know, we had too much numbum, we just took a day off. Yeah. Whilst around the city that we were in, and it was great. Yeah, we could just shout ourselves a day off anytime and chill. Thank you.